Well, we are in a series right now, and we are talking about the disciplines of Christianity. We're doing this series called I Train. And Paul, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, talks about training himself like an athlete. And every week I've gotten up and I have talked to you about this whole thing of training yourself like an athlete. And I just thought it would be great on Super Bowl Sunday to have an athlete who played football to come up and tell us a little bit about training like an athlete. So I want you to welcome Doug Hawley, former Seattle Seahawk, if he would please come to our platform, and I'd like to interview him for a minute. Doug, come on up. Good morning. Good morning. God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> this is Doug Hawley, and his wife is with him. This is Reverend Hawley. Uh, she is from, yes. She is from St. Matthew's Baptist Church. And, Pastor, we appreciate you taking time away from your congregation, your duties to be at Bethel Church with us. She's from Livermore, is ministering there, and it's really an honor to have you with us as well. Doug, welcome to Bethel Church, man. Thank you, Pastor. Glad to have you here. Doug was a tight end for the Seattle Seahawks. Defensive end. Defensive end. What did I say? Tight end. You had the E man, right. Man, I had the end right. <laughs> yes. I messed up the first service and this service. I think you make me nervous. Well, I got butterflies right now. Oh, man. I'm getting close to game Please. time. Yeah, I, exactly. <laughs> well, don't take it out on me. Just don't start hitting anything right now. Wait till you get out of here. Defensive end, Seattle Seahawks, 1985 to 1989. And, man, it is great to have you here. You got any predictions about the game today? God is on our side. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we didn't say anything about what side, just our side. That's good. You can, you can apply that. Praise the Lord. Well, I have been talking to my friends uh, every week of this series about training yourself like an athlete. Would you tell us a little bit about what the characteristics of training are like for an NFL uh, football player? What does well, that look like? Well, before I was an NFL player, it started in a, as a child. Uh, as my grandmother trained me up in the church and taught me how to tithe and offer and, and believe and trust in the Lord. And as I started playing sports, I never forgot how to pray. As time went on through high school and, and college, you know, we have the team prayer and say that I know our Father, Lord in heaven, we say that prayer. Um, but as time went on through the NFL, sometimes you forget what got you there besides you just training your body just for the sport, but not realizing who was the trainer that brought you where you are today. And, and so along the way, I forgot who was the trainer, but the trainer on, on the materialistic things that put me in the league at that time. But God has a funny way of doing things and bring you back around the table and start training and believing in him through faith. Absolutely. And, and so as an athlete, as I stated earlier this morning, you know, for a whole year you're running about 100 miles, you're lifting weights, you're taking your supplements, you're eating red meat, basically a whole cow, if you really want to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> All the starches you can think about. <laughs> and, you know, in and, and, and Texas, everything is big. That's where I went to school at. So I lived there uh, before I moved to the Bay Area. So you, you, you're thinking about a big cowboy steak. And if you know, if you've seen a cowboy steak from Texas, it's about how big as this here. And, you know, your spud potatoes about this big here of size football. So everything is huge there. Uh, so this, that was part of my training, and, uh, my regiment, regiment. Uh, but it's besides lifting weights and running. But yet still, I wasn't walking in a true trainer of God because he did bless me to get to where I was. But now I'm back on the training table now Good. and serving God the way I need to serve him. <laughs> Now, <laughs> Good. which is a beautiful thing. Absolutely. Right. And, and so God put me back on that forefront and blessed me with a wife for 20 years. Congratulations. So we're training together. <laughs> <laughs> so it's ways that 
when you talk about training as an athlete, you, you, you can't forget where your blessings truly come from. Yes, we have the ability. Yes, we have the thoughts. But yet it's God that created us, and he knows what goes in us. Amen. If your heart ain't right, he know our way to make it right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, would you uh, read our scripture for us this morning? Sure. I, I, First I Corinthians um, 9. Chapter 9, 24, 24 to 27, and we're going to be in the Living Bible. In a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the first prize. So run your race to win. To win the contest, you must deny yourself many things that will keep you from doing your best. An athlete goes to all this trouble just to win a blue ribbon or a silver cup. But we do it for a heavenly reward that will never disappear. So I run straight to the goal with a purpose in every step. I fight to win. I'm not just a shadow boxer or a play around. Like an athlete, I, I punish my body, treat it roughly, train, to train it to do it what it should do. Not what, it, not what it wants to do. Otherwise, I fear that after enlisting others for the race, I myself might declare unfit in order to stand aside. In order to stand aside. Doug, would you open us in prayer one more time? Heavenly sure Father, I thank you for this gracious opportunity uh, to be a blessing to the congregation, be a blessing to the young people here that... Um, it's not about the material things or the worldly things, but it's about the Heavenly Father that will bless you in this race called Journey of Life. Lord, I ask you to bless every hear, ear, person, able to hear. And Lord, I ask you to watch over them. And as the word go forth today, bless the congregation and bless the pastor as he present the word to uh, everyone here in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hey, would you thank Doug and his wife for being with us? God bless you, my friend. Yes, yes. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. The Hollies have to leave. They've got some responsibilities. They were with us in the first service, but what an absolute privilege to have them with us today. Talking not only about Seahawks, that's always good, but also uh, just about some personal experience in the NFL. What a great thing. Terrific. Well, in this series, I've been talking to you about different disciplines. And each week, we've been talking about one of the disciplines that can make this year great for you in your walk and in your relationship with Christ. I told you very transparently at the beginning of this series that I want this to be a great year for you. But I'm really hoping for me that this would be a year that I live with fewer regrets than I've ever known, that there are more victories than I've ever experienced, and that I walk in a closeness with God that I have never known up until this point. These are the things that I told the Lord I was interested in this year as we came into a new year. And for that reason, I have brought to you this series. And this series is about disciplines. And as you talk about disciplines, as you talk about the things that make Christians great, I want you to know that this series doesn't come to you from a heart of talking to you about what you aren't doing or what you haven't done correctly or what you need to do more of. That's not the heart behind the delivery of this message. The heart that's behind the delivery of this message is I want you to enjoy the benefits and the blessings that come when we practice the disciplines that God said he would bless in our lives. And for that reason, we spent a week on fasting. And I told you on the other side of fasting are breakthroughs. And I believe that we are going to see breakthroughs in your life, in this church, not just this month, but throughout this entire year. We talked about giving and we talked about the blessings that God wants to put in the area of your finance. We talked about study. We talked about prayer and the blessings that God adds to our life through those disciplines. If you missed the talk that we had last week on prayer, we were in Matthew 6. I'd love you to have a copy of that. It's on a table in the lobby. On your way out, you can pick one of those up as my gift to you. 
Today I want to talk to you about the fifth uh, discipline in this series. Today I want to talk to you about serving. I want to talk to you about service. I want to talk to you about what it is that you do. Because of the fact that you belong to Christ, because of the fact that God has loved you and forgiven you of your sin and you know him, what is it that's coming out of your life in the way of service? James 2 says an interesting thing about this whole idea of serving. He simply says that faith without works is dead. It's one of the most direct and punchy statements that I think you can find anywhere in the whole of Scripture, if that if faith isn't accompanied by action, there's no value in it. Faith and works. Two major ideas in your walk with Christ. Faith expressing itself in what it is that you do is an element that has to be considered as you look at the disciplines of Christianity and an effective year. For James to grab a statement and say, faith without works is dead, it's very, under, it's very important that we have a basic understanding and a working definition in this room today about the concept of faith. Faith is a vague thing. Faith is a misunderstood thing. Faith is a thing that people dismiss pretty quickly in their minds. It's something that they hide behind even as an excuse mechanism. And so I want to spend a couple of minutes just talking to you about faith because this whole faith thing is so foundational in this service thing. It's not enough to just do good things. The reason that you do good things is important. Random acts of kindness are not enough for you to practice. There has to be a reason. There has to be a foundational reason and justification for why you are doing the things that you're doing. Romans 12.3 says this, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself in sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. One of my favorite things about faith is that I don't have to produce it. One of my favorite things about faith is I don't have to manufacture it. One of my favorite things about faith is I don't have to somehow figure out how to get more of it because God has already invested into me and into you a measure of faith. This talk isn't about you getting more faith. This talk is about you utilizing the faith that God has generously already put inside of you. Why is it so important that each of us has faith? Why is it that God would invest something in you like a measure of faith? Because Hebrews 11.6 will come along and tell us an important thing. Hebrews 11.6 will share with us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. That's why God invests into you a measure of faith. That's why he gave to me a measure of faith. Because he wanted to ensure that there would be the ability for me to please him. I can't believe how many people I encounter in my life who are convinced that they can't make God happy. That they can't do enough to please God. That God somehow is like a mean kid with a magnifying glass treating ants badly. That somehow God is detached and angry. God has invested something into you for the express purpose of you being able to please him. He has given you the means by which you can make him happy about you in your life. Do you know that that's God's desire is to celebrate you? That's God's desire to be passionate about you. It's God's desire to enjoy fellowship with you. God's not mad at you. God loves you. God is passionate about you. And he has invested in you what you need to be able to please him. Many people today struggle in their understanding about faith. To too many, faith has become a mystical kind of a term, a mystical kind of a word. Too many people think that faith is something that only a few possess. When faith becomes theory, 
And when faith becomes theology, a very, very bad thing happens in faith. It loses its everyday practical application that faith was given to you for. It is supposed to work in your life every single day. It has grassroots usability. In Hebrews 11, it says the most interesting thing. It says, by faith, as it talks about all these heroes in Scripture, by faith, and then it shares what they did. By faith, Moses did this. By faith, Abraham did this. By faith, by faith, by faith. And then they all did. It's an important thing to understand as you read Hebrews 11 that faith is the motivating reason and justification for all of the action. Faith must be accompanied by action or it doesn't have any value. Faith is not mystical. It's not uh, something that you only use on Sunday. It's designed for everyday existence. Now faith only has value if the item you're putting your faith in has value. There are a lot of people that exercise a lot of faith in a lot of things. My faith in my life, I have selected to put my faith in God in every situation. If it has to do with my family, I trust God. If it has to do with my finances, I trust God. If it has to do with my health, I trust God. If it has to do with this church, I trust God. My faith has value because I have put my faith in something that is trustworthy. And our faith, if we aren't really careful, our faith can get sidelined on things like our feelings. I've watched people get into faith crises in my life. I've tried to walk people through faith crises because they have become, their feelings have become more relevant than their faith the way they feel, and they say to me, well, I feel this, and I feel this, but they're not telling me, I believe this, I'm standing on this. Instead, they just keep quoting their feelings. Friend, anytime your feelings become stronger than your faith, you're going to head into a little bit of a crisis. The other thing that your faith has to be stronger than is your circumstances. Too many people, their faith is in touch, and it's intact until they get into some difficult circumstances then somehow the reality of what they're in the midst of causes their faith to slip. What I see, what I feel, what I encounter is never as great as my faith in God and his ability to help me in the middle of those things. The other thing that faith has to be greater than is, your, is consequence. Moses stood in front of Pharaoh and went head to head. And he wasn't afraid of the consequences. The Bible says in Hebrews 11, fearing not the consequences. We cannot be so afraid of what might happen. We have to stand on faith and not worry so much about consequences. God has given me a measure of faith, Romans 12, 3. We need faith to please God, Hebrews 11, 6. And faith always results in action, James 2. So I want to talk to you today out of James chapter 2. I want to spend some time with you on this discipline. This has been um, one of the great principles in Christianity that has motivated and driven me all of my life. I remember one night, Valerie and I were on our way to dinner. We were late to a dinner, and we were walking across a park and it was one of those parks that you really shouldn't walk through after dark, but it was a shortcut to the dinner, and we were late. And I was more concerned about walking into the dinner late than walking through the park. So we walked through the park, and as we were walking through the park, there was a guy sitting, seated there in the park, and he was leaning uh, uh, next, to, next to his bicycle on this bench, and as we walked by, I am, I am kind of double-stepping it, and trying to get to this dinner, and my wife said, stop. And I said, we're late. She said, we need to talk to this guy. I said, for crying out loud, we're only coming through here to cut time. We're not looking for ministry opportunities. We're late. <laughs> she said, I just really feel like God's telling me that we need to talk to him. 
I said, oh, for crying out loud. We're going to be so late. In our marriage, I'm the keeper of the clock. Valerie wears it for decoration only, just, just to help you understand. So I walked over to this man. I said, hi, I'm late. I have a very little amount of time because I'm late. And my wife here has an idea that we need to talk to you. So I'm going to do this quickly. Um, my name's Brett, and uh, I love Jesus. And uh, um, you need to know that God sent his son to die on a cross for you because he loves you too. And so we just wanted to stop quickly and tell you that. He said, Mr., I've been in this park all day wishing that somebody would stop and talk to me about my life. We missed dinner all together. <laughs> we spent hours with him that night, and we put him on a bus the next day because he was getting to Montana, and when he got off the bus in Montana, an Assemblies of God pastor met him and helped him from there, and he was in church in that little Montana church as many years as I checked on him. There is uh, an interesting thing about saying that you believe in God. There's an interesting thing to say, I belong to Jesus. Because it's going to have impact on what you do. It has to, or the faith, James says, isn't good. He's going to, in chapter 2, he's going to share five different illustrations to help bring this to light, what he's trying to say about faith, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. In verse 14 of chapter 2, I'd, I'd ask you to please open in your Bible to uh, James chapter 2. If you're in one of our church Bibles, it's uh, page 837. And I'm going to start in verse 14 because he says this in verse 14. What good is it, my brothers... If a man claims to have faith, but has no deeds. If you believe in Jesus, action that is consistent with that will accompany it. Talk is cheap. Everybody knows that talk is cheap. Never is the answer more words when someone's in need. Never is the answer a Christian platitude. But when you have faith and then you do something, that's a powerful combination. I remember standing at an altar in front of an Assemblies of God pastor, two Assemblies of God pastors, and taking sacred vows and telling Valerie for the rest of my life, I would love her and I would honor her and I would cherish her in sickness and in health, in riches and in, in, in poverty, until death do us part. I made that promise. I was 20 years old when I got married. And when you stand at an altar at age 20 and you say those words, little do you know that the rest of your life will be lived trying to back up what it was you said you were going to do. Your words only mean something if you're willing to back them with some action. So James is going to pick up some illustrations. And I'm going to start in uh, verse 15 of chapter 2. And then we're going to talk first of all about the destitute believer. Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical need, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. Somebody's in trouble. And James identifies them as a believer. They can't eat. They don't have clothing. He says that kind words aren't enough in this situation. And that if faith 
isn't accompanied by action in this kind of a situation, then the faith is dead. Then he's going to move on to verse 18. And he's going to say that there is a comparison here that's going on between faith and deeds. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I'll show you my faith by what I do. The picture here is about two individuals arguing about this topic of faith. They're comparing what they do and what they believe. One saying, hey, I have faith, and the other saying, I do good things. But please notice, James is going to pull no punches as these people are debating back and forth, and in, in a matter of just a few words, he's going to correct both of them. Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. See your good deeds, and the result is God gets praise because of your good deeds as a result of your faith. 1 Peter 2.12, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. The third illustration that James is going to give us in this passage of chapter 2 is a religious person. Verse 19, you believe that there's one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? This is a man who believes in God. We're not talking about an atheist. We're not talking about an agnostic. He's a believer. And his belief in God is complimented. It's said to be good. You believe in God? Good. Exclamation point. Good. But belief isn't enough. If he's a believer, then there has to be activity. There has to be action. And in one of the most alarming one of the most shocking statements in the whole of Scripture, James says, demons believe, and they shudder, and their belief is not enough. James says that faith without works is useless. Wow. Useless. Worthless. Dead. These are tough words. You know, if I'd written this, I would have said it much kinder to you than that. It's incredibly bold. It's incredibly direct. It's incredibly to the point. And I'm so glad it is. If it really matters, I'm just glad that God's word speaks straight to the point. I'm just glad that this one isn't so covered over that you can't understand it. I'm so glad that James just approaches this thing as important as it is and just says, look, this is how it is. And he's right to the point. The fourth example that he's going to give us is an example surrounding Abraham. It says in verse 21, Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. Abraham is credited by proving his faith through what he did. He proved what he believed by what he did. His faith is labeled as working together with his actions. It's really significant that when we as followers of Christ read Scripture, that we don't ever put the word or where God has put the word and. You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. It's not faith or actions. It's faith and action. The end result of this is that Abraham became a close friend of God. Relationships 
The relationship with me and God improves to friendship when my faith is expressed in what I do and when it isn't expressed in my actions. It's considered useless, worthless, and dead. Abraham's always been one of those characters in Scripture that's hard for me to draw a point of relatability to. There's just not a lot about Abraham that I can say, oh yeah, Abraham and I are just like. And I think James knows that. I think that James understands that Abraham had an incredible faith and he did some incredible things to prove it. So he comes up with another illustration that's a little bit more down to earth. It's probably a little easier to grab onto. He uses an example, the fifth example is about Rahab. In verse 25 it says this, in the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction? As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Rahab, the prostitute. Her connection points with Abraham are minimal. This is the statement here in James that will unite them. And the thing that connects them is a simple statement by James. And in verse 21, he says of Abraham, Abraham considered, it was considered righteousness for what he did. And Rahab, in verse 25, Rahab, the prostitute, considered righteous for what she did. Both of them are considered righteous because of their actions demonstrated their faith. What a great principle for us in this church. We're all different. We have different backgrounds. We have different strengths. We come from different nationalities. We have different experiences in even coming to Jesus. We have different questions. We have different problems. We have different issues in our life. And while there's so many differences, one thing about you and me and everybody else in this place is not different. God honors our faith when it is expressed through action. It doesn't matter if we're talking about Abraham or we're talking about Rahab, the father of many nations, the friend of God, or a prostitute. The result is the same, exactly the same, when we express our faith through action. Each week of this series, I've left you with some questions. Questions that I want to bring to you just as a way to give you something to think about as you are working your way through the material of this discipline. And today, um, before I give you those questions, um, I want to say I really think it's important that when we preach about something, when I preach about something, that we give you opportunity to act on it. I'm talking to you about service, and um, a question we receive every single week around here is this, how do I get involved? Can I get involved? Could I help with something? I haven't been here very long. How long do I have to be here to get involved? Can I get involved? What do I need to do? And when you leave today, there are going to be some tables out in the lobby, and there's going to be some information on them, and there's going to be some people there. And if you'd like to get involved in some service here at Bethel Church, I want to make it uh, easy for you to approach somebody and ask questions, write your name down, get contacted by somebody. And some of the, the ministries that we're making available for you to stop and connect with today are our children's ministry. We have children's ministry going on on this campus and on our Santa Clara campus much of the week. We also... I have greeters and we have ushers in this church. And if you'll stop and talk to Eddie Shaw at the diplomatic core table, she'll talk to you about being a greeter or being an usher. And if you write your name down, we'll contact you. You you don't have to know what to do. We'll train you. We'll help you on that. But I'd love to see some of you serving in that capacity. Some of you should be in the choir. Some of you can sing. Some of you, it would be a great expression of your faith for you to get involved in the choir of this church. John won't let me in the choir. 
I, I've, I've snuck in, and he just says, uh, why don't you pray, and then you can leave. And, and it's, it's all I get to do for the choir is pray. I don't get to sing. I've never been asked to do a solo in this church, not once. <laughs> if you belong in the choir, sign up. If you're like me and you don't belong in the choir, then don't sign up. But if you belong in the choir, sign up. And then there's a, a table out there, it's titled First Serve. And some of you are brand new around here. Some of you are still trying to figure out what you're doing in your relationship with Jesus. Some of you have still not given your life to Christ, but you want to be involved. We've got areas where you can be involved even while you're trying to figure out your relationship with Jesus. So stop there and talk to the, the person that's at that first serve table. They'll help you with that. Let me give you these three questions. What is it about practicing faith that scares you? What is it that keeps you from stepping outside yourself and functioning in faith in a practical way and doing something outside yourself? What is it that scares you? What is it that keeps you forced into a comfort zone of coming and sitting and not participating? What is that thing? The reason I ask you that question is because I think it would be so great for you to identify in yourself what it is that keeps you from serving because you're afraid so that you can deal with that issue. Some people have told me I could never minister. I could never serve because of what I was, because of where I was, because of what I said, because of what I did. Please don't let that kind of stuff keep you from expressing your faith in action. The second question is this. Does your faith result in action? When's the last time you can say, I did something because I believe? I did something because I have this faith in God that's bigger than my circumstances. And the third question is this. What areas could you serve and by doing so exercise your faith? If you'd like to stop by a table, you can do that. If you don't want to stop by a table, that's fine too. You just need to understand that I feel very strongly that it's my responsibility to give you an opportunity to act after a message like this. It all comes down to being between you and the Lord. But it's my responsibility to give you an opportunity to act. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. But I want to compliment you on something before I do. This is the fifth week in a row I've been talking about disciplines. And this is the fifth week in a row that this church has sat quietly and attentively and leaned forward on teaching about discipline. And I want to tell you something about Christians today, about people in general today. They don't want to hear a lot about disciplines. And I commend you for the way you listen. I commend you for the way you lean in. And I commend you for uh, the way that you have received these last five weeks of teaching about the disciplines of our faith that make us great in our walk with Jesus. I just compliment you for that. And I praise you as your pastor. I praise your, your attentiveness and your actions on these things. Many of you have fasted. Many of you signed on to try something for six weeks on your tithe. And many of you have uh, made comments to me and emails to me about prayer and about study. I just commend you. This has really been a great series for me as your pastor to watch you as a church respond to. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. I'd like to have a word of prayer for you real quick. Father, I thank you for the men and women and young people that are in this congregation this morning. I thank you for our friends that are in Santa Clara. And I thank you, Lord, for the people who are listening on the internet to this talk. God, you know each of us individually and you deal with us individually. And so God, this week, I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit in a gentle way that you would engage people one-on-one -on, -one on this topic 
of their faith being expressed through action. Help my friends, God. Help us as a church. Help me, Lord, as we follow after you. While your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed, I'd like to ask you a question. Some of you, uh, as you listen to me talk today about doing things for the Lord, as you hear me talk about faith, as you hear me talk about a relationship with God, maybe you're here today and you're checking this thing out. You're kicking the tires on Christianity and you're just trying to figure out what's right for you. Maybe you're at the point in your life that you haven't surrendered your life to Christ. Maybe you're at the point in your life where you have never said that prayer asking Jesus to forgive you of your sin and surrendering your life to him. I sure like to give you that opportunity today. So quietly where you sit, I would invite you to Repeat this prayer after me. It's a prayer of invitation where we're going to ask Jesus to come into our lives. And I would invite you to pray this with me right where you're at. Dear Jesus, I know I've sinned, and I'm sorry. I ask for your forgiveness. And I ask for you to come into my life. I want you to change who I am, what I am, and I want my life to make an impact for you. I want you to be my Lord. I want to live the plan that you designed for me. Please come into my life. Change me, I pray.